It's officially summertime, and we are launching into a new series, Disciple. We are going to be looking at different disciples this, during this summer, all the way up until the students get here in August. I'm excited about this series, and this morning we are going to learn about a familiar disciple. His name is Simon Peter. How many of you have heard of Simon Peter before? I have a question for you. Oh, church, do you love Jesus? Yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? We sure we love Jesus. And why do you love Jesus? Because he first loved me. That's the reason we all ought to. Everyone together. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Do you love Jesus? I know I love Jesus. Every disciple, there is one characteristic of all of God's disciples is that they love Jesus. Simon Peter, he truly loved Jesus. And uh, if, you were, if I were to pick three words to describe Simon Peter, it would be these. Brash, aggressive, and impulsive. Would you agree? He reminds me of an uncontrollable horse. Have you ever ridden on an uncontrollable horse before, at least seen one? You want it to stop and it goes, and you want it to go, but it stays so it can eat grass. That's Peter. This uncontrollable horse, this morning, we are going to learn how Jesus controlled this wild horse called Peter. And if Jesus can tame Peter, I know that he can tame us too. Hallelujah. Let's pray. God, here we are. We're learning about the disciples. Really, we are learning about ourselves because we are your disciples. And as we learn about Simon Peter today, I pray that you would give us hope. I pray that you would open our eyes to learn the lessons you want us to learn today. Speak through me. May Nestor be hidden behind the cross. And may Jesus Christ be glorified for all he is worth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. We are going to spend most of our time in two books of the Bible, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, the first gospel written by Matthew. And I'm beginning with verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Matthew 16, verse 14. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Verse 16, here's this uncontrollable horse, Simon Peter. He answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got it right. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It gives me much hope, gives us much hope to know that despite our flaws, and if there was someone who had character flaws, that was Simon Peter. But despite Simon Peter's character flaws, God still revealed his truth to him. And if you have been aware of your character flaws this week, I have good news for you that you can still, God can still reveal his truth to you. And so Jesus continues in verse 18, and I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Finally, finally they were understanding that Jesus was the Messiah. Look what happens in the next verse, verse 21. From that time, 
Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now look at this, verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Who has the audacity to rebuke Jesus Christ? Only this wild horse, Simon Peter. He rebuked Jesus and he said, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Verse 23, but he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus rebuked Satan, who inspired Peter. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's the problem with this? I mean, what's so bad about Peter saying, far be it from you, Lord? Didn't Peter have good motives? I mean, he was sincere, right? He was sincere. He didn't want his Lord to die. This is true. But although Peter was sincere, Peter was sincerely wrong. While Peter wanted to protect Jesus' life, he was inspired by this devilish idea that Jesus did not have to suffer and die. In other words, Peter believed that the cross was not necessary. I love these words in one of them my favorite books on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages, page 415. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. Did you catch that? Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. Peter did not believe that the cross is necessary. He thought the, the death of Jesus, that would be too high of a cost. I love my Savior. Lord, I love you so much. You are not going to go through that because your life needs to be protected. You're my best friend. But who was the one instigating? Who was the one insinuating this idea that Jesus should not go to the cross? It was Satan. Satan himself. Desire of Ages, page 416. The words of Christ were spoken not to Peter, but to the one who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get thee behind me, Satan. No longer interpose between me and my erring servant. Let me come face to face with Peter that I may reveal to him the mystery of, lie, of my love. Satan would not stop Jesus from revealing his great love through his death on the cross. Hallelujah. So Jesus turns to his disciples and he says these words, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know what Jesus is saying here? Peter, disciples, don't believe the devil. I love my Father in heaven and I love you. You see, Peter, disciples, love has a cost. And I am going to the cross. And if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross too. Jesus is teaching Peter this lesson. Love has a cost. You know, there is a cost to follow God. The, the cost to follow Jesus, not rosy, not easy. The road, to follow, the road to follow Christ is not an easy road to follow. But I want to tell you that the sacrifice to following Jesus Christ is worth it. You know, um, I remember almost three years ago, July 7, 2013, Seminary Chapel, Andrews University, Berrien Springs. It was a hot day. It was a great day because I remember standing up on the stage as my bride was walking down the aisle. And she looked beautiful. You should have seen the smile, the smirk on my face. The photographer took the picture. And I will never forget her reading her vows to me. I actually sang my vows to her. And the pastor asked Catherine, and he asked me, Pastor Dan Rocker, he asked, do you commit to what you just expressed in your vows? And both of us said those words, two words, say it with me, I do. Ah, you know, those of you who are married, you do. You remember that. And those of you who want to get married, it'll come, don't worry, just trust the Lord in his time. I want to tell you that that day was special. I spent money, I spent a lot of energy 
and a lot of time on our wedding. I proposed to Catherine in October, and my last semester at the seminary, I was actually, I was preparing to preach, uh, I think it was a six-week evangelistic series. I was so busy, but yet I was making time to plan for our wedding, and then about uh, two months before our wedding, I moved to Wisconsin, where I was assigned to pastor in a four-church district, and I, while I was trying to uh, find housing, I find an, an apartment, while I was learning about the district and working with the people, I was also planning our wedding. A lot of time, a lot of energy, and I want to tell you today that I still spend money, energy, and time in our marriage. Question. Is the sacrifice worth it, Nestor? My answer to you is, of course it's worth it. You know why? Because I am madly in love with a woman sitting right there, Catherine, now Soriano. Thank you for taking my last name. The sacrifice is worth it. Love has a cost. And I want to tell you today that there is a cost to follow Jesus Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote, in his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. We must die to self. We must die to the world. We must die to evil thinking and speaking. We must die to sin. We must die to the easy road. I had the privilege in 2006 to, do, to be part of a team, this friendship team we called ourselves, in Lebanon. They're at Middle East University, one of our universities there. And my professor told me about this young woman that we would meet who was a, uh, who was a Muslim who, who became a Christian. And so we got over there, and I met this young lady, and I was inspired when Pastor, when Pastor Glenn Russell told me this story. I don't remember her name, but I do remember this story. That several years before Pastor Russell would bring a, a team of young people every year. This young girl was in the elementary school, and it's interesting, our, that elementary school, we did, a week, we did a week of prayer there, 75, 80% Muslim, only 15 to 20% Christians. This young girl was so moved by the stories of Jesus Christ that she became, she decided to become a Christian. She struggled with the thought, what's going to happen? My family's going to, to uh, disown me. Everyone's going to hate me. It was not, it's not popular to become a Christian in a Muslim country, but she, one day she made a decision to become a Christian. Lo and behold, she went back home. She told her parents. Parents weren't happy. They beat her. She was persecuted for her faith. She struggled because of her decision to follow Jesus Christ. And if I were to ask her today, young lady, was the sacrifice worth it? I know that she would say, yes, the sacrifice is worth it. Because Jesus loves me and I love him. And therefore, any sacrifice that I make for him is nothing compared to the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And every time I commit to following Jesus Christ, even though it's not easy, I experience the greatest joy and happiness in my life. My friends, I want to tell you, love has a cost. Matthew 17, verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. We must enter by the narrow gate, and I praise God that Jesus always does what he asks us to do. Jesus asks us to carry our cross because he carried his cross first. Hallelujah. Josh McDowell in his book, The Last Christian Generation, said this, The worship of God has always involved a sacrifice. It began with the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and culminated with the blood of the perfect and spotless Lamb of God, Christ Himself. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, love has a cost. I took up my cross because I love you, Peter. And because I took up my cross, you must take up your cross too. But there's another lesson Jesus wants to teach Peter. Come with me to Matthew chapter 14. 
two chapters before Matthew 16. Matthew 14, beginning with verse 22. If you're with me, please give me a big and hearty. God is good. Amen, I agree. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. The fourth watch of the night was between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. This is early dawn. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30, But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, what happened? The wind ceased. My friends, it brings me much joy to know that Jesus has the power to stop any storm. If that's good news to you, please say amen. But the reality, let's be honest here, the reality is that we are just like Peter. We focus on the storm. Did you catch what happened in verse 30? But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, oh, the storm was wild and raging. He was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Catherine and I took a hike the other day to Emerald Lake. Anyone been to Emerald Lake in Rock, Rocky Mountain National Park? It's not that hard of a hike. But uh, we, went, we saw Bear Lake. Actually, we saw Bear Lake on the way back. We went to Crystal Lake there at Rocky Mountain National Park. We saw Crystal Lake. We saw Nymph Lake. And there was one lake that we had to go to that was the end of our destination, and then we would, we would go back. Emerald Lake. There's still snow up there, at least when we went the other day. There were some clouds in the sky. Didn't think that it was going to uh, rain on us. So we just started hiking. An hour passed by, an hour and a half. Finally, we got to Emerald Lake, and most of it was covered with snow. And when we got there, we saw a group of people. We were, Catherine wanted to take some pictures. All of a sudden, it started to sprinkle. Then it started to rain. And then it started to lightly, these little ice pellets started hitting us. And then it started to hail. And I remember Catherine saying, hey, I want, let's take one more picture. I said, no, we have to go. You know why? Because I was thinking about the storm. You know what I was, go was going through my mind? I was thinking, I hope that we don't get stuck in this storm. I hope it doesn't come. I don't have any, I don't have a poncho. I don't have any rain gear. I'm going to be soaking wet. I hope we can get back. And every time, every time I thought about the storm, I worried. Every time I thought, oh no, are we going to make it? I was, I stressed out. But God's message to me and to you is stop looking at the storm. Stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. You might be worried. Come on, Pastor. You don't understand how much it hurts my heart to have kids who don't believe in God anymore. I raise them in the church. They've gone through my schools and they don't believe in God anymore. My answer to you is stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. Pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand our financial situation. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills this month. My answer to you is stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. 
And the Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. God will not forsake you. Hallelujah. Pastor, you don't understand. My marriage is falling apart. I don't even feel like I love my spouse anymore. Stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. I'm not sure if we're going to have enough students to meet budget next year here at Campion Academy. Stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. Pastor, you don't, you're not a parent yet. My kids, they are uncontrollable. I can't control them. They're, it's like trying to herd cats. They just, no, it's impossible. Stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. Pastor, you know I've been praying. I have been praying that our campus, our church, HMS, Campion Academy, that this campus would be a place where we worship God and it would become a missionary training center so that we would send people out into the community and out into the world to win people for Jesus. Pastor, I want that to happen, but we are so far from that goal. I'm with you. I feel the same way. Let's stop looking at the storm and let's look to Jesus. Pastor, I can't kick this bad habit in my life. No one knows the struggle, the guilt I feel when I do this habit over and over again. And I promise myself, I promise my God, I promise God tomorrow I'm going to stop and I just fall into the same cycle. I want to tell you, stop looking at the storm. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 382. When trouble comes upon us now, now often... We are like Peter. How often we are like Peter. We look upon the waves instead of keeping our eyes fixed upon who? Fixed upon the Savior. Our footsteps slide and the proud waters go over our souls. Jesus did not bid Peter come to him that he should perish. He does not call us to follow him and then forsake us. Isaiah 43 verses 1 through 3. Fear not for I have, re I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the waters, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel thy Savior. Jesus can calm any storm in your life. Look to Jesus. Jesus tries to teach Peter this crucial lesson. Depend on me. And in these somber words, Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, page 382, in this incident on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weakness to show that his safety was in constant dependence upon divine power. Amid the storms of temptation, he could walk safely only as in utter self-distrust he should rely upon the Savior. And then she says, listen to this, had he learned the lesson that Jesus sought to teach him in that experience on the sea, he would not have failed when the great test came upon him. Wow. What great test are you talking about, Pastor? Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 14, and I'll show you. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 27. Jesus is eating his last supper with his disciples. And the Bible says in verse 27, And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Verse 28. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, here it is, here's this wild horse Peter. Impulsive Peter, he says to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Verse 30, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me how many times? You will deny me three times. But you know, Peter, Peter is a self overconfident, self-dependent man. Ooh, the man of man. Oh, oh, I'm a man. 
And this manly man said in verse 31, but he spoke more vehemently, raised his voice to his Savior. And he said, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Read my lips, Jesus. I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Everyone followed this wild horse, Peter. It was a calm and cool night. The moon was shining on their countenances as they followed Jesus. And they walked that familiar path to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus told the disciples, sit here while I pray. And Jesus knelt down and prayed, and he sweat tears of blood in agonizing prayer to his Father. All things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He prayed that prayer. The Jewish leaders and their cruel crew barged in on Jesus as if he was a criminal, and they arrested him. They bring Jesus to the high priest. And there he is tried. He is beaten. But that brave Peter follows behind at a distance and he lingers in the courtyard. And you know the rest of the story. Here's what happens, verse 66. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. I know it. I knew it. 68. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. Denial number one. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed, verse 69. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. Verse 70, but he denied it, number, denied it again. Strike number two. And then a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Verse 71, then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Strike number three. Three, a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the words that Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Peter denied his best friend, Jesus. But do you know where, Jesus failed, where Peter failed Jesus? Peter failed Jesus in the courtyard because he failed Jesus in Gethsemane. Here's why. Jesus needed the prayers of his close disciples and friends. Can you please sit here? I'm going to go over here and pray. Just pray over here. And after Jesus pled with the Father, God, please, please, help. He stands back up. What are they doing? Verse 37. Then he came and he found them sleeping. And who does he speak to? He found the disciples sleeping. And he says to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Verse, 48, verse 38. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Desire of Ages, pages 713 and 714. It was in sleeping when Jesus bade him watch and pray that Peter had prepared the way for his great sin. Did you catch what she just said? It was in sleeping when Jesus bade him watch and pray that Peter had prepared the way for his great sin. Had those hours in the garden been spent in watching and prayer, Peter would not have been left to depend upon his own feeble strength. And then she is so bold to say these words, he would not have denied his Lord. Peter denied Jesus because he depended upon his own strength. And do you know why he depended upon his own strength? Because he failed to pray. When you fail, you will fail your Savior when you fail to pray. We will fail our Savior when we fail to pray. There's a quote that I quote a lot, and I'm going to summarize it for you. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 203, that the greatest victories for us is when we go into the audience chamber with God and we plead before Him. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ are those 
when we go into our audience chamber and pray before God. If that is true, then the opposite must be true. What is the opposite? The opposite is that our greatest failures come when we fail to go to our audience chambers and pray before the living God. God, let this be our prayer. Oh Lord, even if I'm busy, even when I have so much to do, Lord, you know my schedule, I, my kids, my work. Even when I'm tired, please, please teach me to pray. We are in our young adult Sabbath school today. Caleb, young man, great family. He has a great family. They come to this church, shared. I have my own business. And he was sharing that this week, Despite the busyness of his schedule, he prioritized time with God every single day. And he could share, as well as me and my wife, Catherine, we were all sharing that because we have put aside time each day to spend with the Lord, we've experienced more joy, we've experienced happiness, we've experienced the presence of Jesus with us. Could it be, could it be that the reason that we fail in our lives and in our spiritual lives is because we fail to pray? Can you imagine how Peter prayed after he failed Jesus? The Bible says that he wept. Oh God. I told Jesus that I would not deny him. And just like Jesus said, he denied me three times. Oh, Lord, would you please forgive me? Please. I'm weeping my heart out because I just denied my Lord, my Savior. Father, please. Would you please, please forgive me? Peter prays that prayer. Jesus carries his cross the nails drive through his hands and his, are driven through his hands and his feet. Jesus is crucified and he's buried in the tomb. Peter thinks to himself, I can't believe that I denied Jesus. And on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, come to Christ's tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. And they wonder, who will roll away the stone for us? That stone is huge. And when they came to the stone, the, the stone, they noticed that the stone was rolled away. They went inside, and they saw this being inside. Mark chapter 16, last chapter now in verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, that there you will see him as he said to you. Now, why would, why would the angel say to these ladies, but go tell his disciples, and then what? And Peter. I mean, couldn't he just say, and go tell the disciples that Jesus is going to meet, meet them by the Sea of Galilee? Why would the angel say, the disciples and Peter? Good question. It's as if Jesus was saying this through the angel. Peter, I know you denied me in the courtyard. It broke my heart to know that you failed me. It broke my heart. But I heard your prayers, Peter. I have forgiven you, Peter. And just in case you think, you, don't, you think that you're not a disciple anymore, I want you to know that you are still my disciple and I'm calling you out by name. Peter, I forgive you and I still accept you. Jesus can still forgive and accept us even when we fail. Can you say amen? Maybe you failed the Lord this past week. Oh, Lord, I have blown it. I want to tell you today that there is a bomb in Gilead. His name is Jesus, and he can still forgive you. He can still give you peace and hope, and he can still accept you. 
Jesus can forgive. Jesus can change you. Peter is thrilled when he sees his Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, there's, there's, that's that Jesus? That's Jesus. Lord, I failed you. I've forgiven you. And then Peter receives the most important, the greatest hug in his life because he knows he's been forgiven. He knows that he has not been forsaken. And then they're by the water. John's, <laughs> Jesus says this, you read, we're not going to go, we're not going to read the whole passage, but he says in John 21, verse 17, after, after he's forgiven, after he's spending time with the disciples, Jesus also asks Peter, he says these words, feed my sheep. Three words, feed my sheep. Peter looks, he's thinking to himself, me? Jesus, come on, are you serious? I, feel, I denied you three times. Me? You want me to feed your sheep? You want me to teach people about you? You want me to preach about you? And you want me to, to lead people to you, to Jesus Christ? Lord, I failed you. And then Jesus says these words, I know you failed me, but I've forgiven you. And Peter, I can still use you. I can still use you. And the rest is here's history. You know, Acts chapter 1, Peter becomes the leader of the remaining disciples and tells them that they should find a replacement for Judas. In Acts chapter 2, now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches the first evangelistic series. 3,000 people are baptized. Acts chapter 3, Peter heals a man who had never walked since birth. Acts chapter 8, Peter and John are sent to Samaria to teach the people about God. Acts chapter 9, Peter travels to different places to tell people about Jesus, and God uses Peter to bring a little girl back to life. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, a Gentile, hears about Jesus for the first time from Peter. Acts chapter 12, an angel takes Peter out of prison so he can keep spreading the gospel. Peter writes two letters, first and second Peter, and according to tradition, in about 64 AD, Peter is crucified upside down because he feels unworthy to die the same way as Jesus Christ. Peter failed Jesus, but Jesus still used him for 30 years of ministry. Can you say amen? Even when you fail, Jesus can still use failures. Jesus can still use failures. I got this story. This is not a minister or pastor or evangelist tale, a true story. Pastor Phil Jones, a member of our congregation, retired evangelist, shared this story. He was holding a series of meetings. And a man came to him. He said, Pastor Phil, I hear what you're saying, but I really need to talk to you. Okay, let's talk. They set an appointment. They sat down. He said, Pastor Phil, can Jesus forgive someone who has killed 10 people? Oh, yeah, Jesus can forgive. What about 100? Yes, Jesus can, give, can still forgive someone who has killed 100 people. What about 1,000 people? Yes, he can. He can still forgive. What about 10,000 people, Pastor Phil? This moment, at this point, Pastor Phil was nervous. What? 10,000? What is he going to do? Yes, he can forgive someone who's killed 10,000 people. Pastor Phil, what about 100,000 people? Sir, Jesus can still forgive someone who's killed 100,000 people. Pastor Phil, not a lot of people know this, but I was the man who pressed the button to drop a bomb in Nagasaki. Killed hundreds of thousands of people. I failed. Can Jesus still forgive me? Yes, he can forgive you. That man prayed the sweetest prayer in his life, Lord, forgive me. And although his robe was all spotted, Jesus cleansed him of his sin and gave him a new robe of righteousness. 
that bomber became a Christian, was baptized, and became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And listen to this. The last time that Phil Jones heard from him, you know what he was doing? He was teaching Sabbath school in his local church. Jesus can still use failures. If that's good news to you, please say amen. Peter learned. Peter learned that love requires sacrifice. He learned to look to Jesus. But Peter also learned that important lesson that Jesus can still use failures. I like what Karen Goodman says in her book, Grab a Broom, Lord, There's Dust Everywhere. It's a catchy title. She says this one line that is powerful. There is always life after lapses. Did you catch what she said? There is always life after lapses. Maybe you have lapsed. Maybe you have failed. But I want to tell you, you still came in here this morning. You still have life. There is always life after lapses. And although you have fallen down and you feel you can't get up, all you have to do is say, Lord, forgive me. Would you please help? And your Savior looks down and he lifts you up. You will be okay because Jesus forgives and he can still use failures. And Peter shares these last words. I'll read it for you. His last epistle, the last verse of his last epistle, the last words ever recorded from Peter, 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Simon Peter, that wild horse became an obedient servant of Jesus Christ. But you know, Simon Peter had to learn the hard way, but eventually he learned to trust in the grace of Jesus Christ. And I have an appeal, simple appeal, that today you would give God a happy Father's Day. I know it's Father's Day tomorrow to all your dads, congratulations. Happy Father's Day. But could you give God a happy Father's Day today? How so, Pastor? Well, simple. Place your trust in Jesus. Someone here wants to say, oh God, help me. Help, I don't know what it looks like, but I just want to take a leap of faith. Or I have believed before, and I just want to continue. If you're saying today, Lord, I want to place my full trust in Jesus who can lead my life, would you raise your hand with me? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if there's someone here who has not yet entrusted your life to Jesus, you want to give your life to Christ, specifically to accept Christ as your Savior and to be baptized. I'm going to humbly request, pull out your Connect card, not that card that just flew. Pull out your Connect card. Fill out your name. Drop it in the bag, the plate, as the, off the deacons collect the offering at, as we sing the closing hymn. But right down on the back, I'm interested in information on baptism. We'd love to serve you. We'd love to help you and lead you to Jesus Christ. The other, the other day, someone came to Pastor Michael, said, I'd like to be baptized. Praise the Lord. If you're here, praise the Lord for your commitment. Maybe there's someone else that'd like to make that commitment. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is good, and all we must do is trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Let's sing this song. George is going to lead us in this closing hymn. Fill out the connect card. We'd love to hear from you. Trust and obey.
when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly dries it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but if, if we trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. love until on the altar we lay what he's over he shows for the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no to trust and obey. <clears throat> then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk in His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. We thank you for those last words of Peter but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Just one more word. We're glad you've joined us today. You're always welcome to join us here in worship. But we want to be available to you. If you have a prayer request, we have a prayer team that are eager to be praying for you. If you want to connect with a pastor, ask a question. If you feel you'd like to help support these teachings being online, I want to invite you to contact the number on the screen, 970-667-7403. Or the website, we'll put that on the screen for you. You go there, you can contact us, leave a prayer request, connect with us. We'd be honored to hear from you and how we can help you in your spiritual journey. But until next time, 
know that Jesus is searching for you.